Is it possible to get a band nine in IELTS speaking? Absolutely. And in today's video, I interview a student who did just that. Hello, this is Keith from the Keith Speaking Academy and the YouTube channel English Speaking Success. Now, it is true, right, that it is extremely difficult, especially for non-native speakers of English, to get a band nine in IELTS speaking, but it is possible. And in today's video, I interviewed Djorbek from Uzbekistan, who recently got a band nine in his IELTS speaking. Amazing, right? So we have a conversation where we go through different IELTS topics and questions so that you can listen to and learn from his answers. And I also highlight some of the features that make him such a confident band nine speaker. Now, a note, very few people actually need a band nine in IELTS speaking. For most, it's not a necessary goal it's not a realistic goal because it takes years and years to build up to that level, okay? So I don't want you to feel that you have to speak like this. I just want this video to guide you, to show you a great source of language and inspiration. Listen, let's dive in. Jorbik, hello, how are you? Nice I'm, I'm to great. See you. Nice to see you too. Good. Am I pronouncing your name correctly? Yes, you're doing a great job. It's Diorbek. Diorbek. Okay, great. And where are you from, Diorbek? Yeah, I'm from Uzbekistan. Uh, I'm from um, Nawai, um, and but I've been living in, in Tashkent for the better part of six years now. Right. Okay. Tell me a bit about Tashkent and what it's like. Well, Tashkent is growing by lips and bounds, I would say, because of all the investment. Um, and Tashkent is really what we, you could call a growing multicultural city. I see a lot of people from different backgrounds, especially in uh, more um, affluent parts of the city. Uh, but generally, yeah, it's a, it's a great city to, to be living. Um, I enjoy living in Tashkent. And Tashkent, I, I, I think it has a population of two or three million people at, at this point. Uh, I don't know the exact statistics, but from, from what I can guess, that's what it is. It's quite big. So do you get a lot of tourists in Tashkent? Yes, um, especially nowadays. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if, uh, if the season um, determines how many tourists uh, come to Tashkent, but I believe the fact that we now have, um, you know, a lot of, Fruit. And I, I think many people in Uzbekistan to, to Uzbekistan come to, um, you know, enjoy food. I think our, our food is probably one of the best things we can offer to tourists as well as our history. Um, so we do have a lot of tourists. I see a lot of people enjoying Tashkent Metro um, and Tashkent Metro is like really famous. So okay. when you, there's incredible architecture, um, you know, Soviet architecture, you can see. Um, yeah. Interesting. I, I think, yeah. Nice. Um, so tell me, what do you do there? Well, I, I run a test prep center. We we um, help students prepare for the IELTS exam and uh, SAT. But although we are focusing on the latter more, um, you know, next year, next academic year. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So at the start of the IELTS speaking test, you get some introductory questions, normally about um, where you live, what you do, work or study, right? Here, Jorbeck talks about the town where he's living, uh, Tashkent, and also about a little bit about his job. He uses a wide range of vocabulary to show his control of these topics, right? Um, he talks about people with different backgrounds, in the city, affluent parts of the city, affluent meaning wealthy. Um, he says it is growing by leaps and bounds, by leaps and bounds, meaning quickly and a lot. And he has a nice trick. He talks about the population. 
He said it's about 2 million. And I don't know the exact statistics, but I guess that's it. Very useful phrases. Don't worry if you don't know the exact name or the exact numbers. Just show off your English saying, well, I don't know the exact statistics, right? The numbers. Lovely. He talks about tourism. Great collocations. He talks about the tourist season, incredible architecture. And the use of these collocations helps his fluency so he can continue talking over a long sentence almost without pausing. Absolutely brilliant. Let's get straight back in. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, so I'm going to ask you a few questions on a, an interesting topic, um, which is the topic of happiness, right? So I'd like to know what makes you happy? Well, I think happiness is a state of being and um, I don't think happiness is something that you preach to, you know, uh, you get hold of. Um, but these days, um, I think the things that make me happy is when I spend time with my friends and I, you know, we usually go to a sports bar and uh, watch football. Today, ho hopefully we're watching Manchester City play the FA Manchester Cup. The FA Cup. So, you know, when I spend quality time with my friends, that's, that makes me happy. Nice. And as a child, um, what made you happy as a child? Well, as a child, you know, literally anything under the sun, I think, make, makes you happy. It's very easy. I, I guess I was lucky enough to have carefree childhood. You know, I, I didn't have... You know, for example, abusive parents or whatever. Um, I, I had a really, um, thankfully, I had a good childhood. So my, I was happy when, um, you know, my parents took me to the park when they bought me a toy. You know, those kinds of things made me happy when I was a child. Mm. And uh, do you feel happy at work? Yes, um, I, uh, I, I derive a lot of pleasure uh, from what I do, and, and that's why I do what I do. I talk. Um, to a lot of people, people from all walks of life. You know, I am quite an extroverted person. So I, I think that's the main reason what, uh, why I do what I do. You know, I, I enjoy talking to people. And especially when they um, get the results they want, uh, you know, I feel quite satisfied with what I have been able to do, you know, help them somehow um, in their pursuit of um, maybe going to a good university or improving their job prospects. Mm, absolutely. And in the future, what do you think will make you happy? Um, in the future, probably settling settling down and starting a family of my own. Um, I'm actually working on it. <laughs> so <laughs> um, that will make me happy. And I also have plans um, to expand my business of uh, this education center. So in summer, we are, you know, deciding we've decided to rebrand and then hopefully grow this, um, you know, test prep center and include more uh, tests in our curriculum. Fantastic. Sounds exciting. I'm sure that'll make you happy as well, as well as the family project <laughs> that, you're, that you're on. <laughs> nice. Um, now, you mentioned earlier going to a sports bar. I'd, I'd like to ask you a bit more about sports. Um, so generally, what sports do you like? Oh, well, like I said, I enjoy football a lot because as a kid, I wanted to be a football player. And I, I, I found myself reading a lot of articles from The Athletic. It's a very a good publication. I watch a lot of football and I go to the gym five times a week. Um, yeah, I'm quite into fitness and um, yeah, these are two sports I do and right. I enjoy watching. So with football, how did you learn to play football? Um, I I think I was natural, you know. Um, um, I think I was a natural in a sense. I, I can dribble easily and i guess you know not to toot my own horn <laughs> I, I guess i have a good vision too you know when i'm in the pitch i'm able to um see and sense what other players in my team are going to do so mm. i think yes it, when i play football I, I do quite a good job not mm. to not to sound too braggy <laughs> <laughs> right exactly um and do you think sport is important for young people Yes, definitely. I mean, if you do sports, I mean, you you are in shape, and you look better, and you feel better. Um, I think it's important that people maybe go to the gym at least three times a week. Um, and and I mean, I think 
I started going to the gym like a year ago, and I honestly think this habit um, is something that I should have started much earlier, probably maybe when I was 18 or 17, probably. Why do you say so? Um, because now I feel like my life has been uh, transformed and I'm a lot more positive than um, I was before. You know, when I get the, I guess, endorphins, are the, the chemicals, I guess, you you know, you release and when you do exercise mm -hmm. and, and you feel much better, I, I feel more energetic in the morning and and small things don't make me angry anymore i, I believe and I, right. overall, when i look at myself i feel a lot better and the most important question who is going to win the fa cup final today um i'm rooting for city honestly um many people might not <laughs> like my saying that um because of you know city's um association with um you know oil rich countries but I am um, rooting for City because I want Pep to win a treble one more time. Right, right. And I think the team is doing an incredible job, especially defensively. They are incredible this year. Yeah, you're absolutely right. They, they've come on incredibly well. Let's have a look at some of the language that came up. When talking, first of all, about happiness, he said, I'm happy when I spend quality time with my friends. Quality time. Great collocation, very common, meaning time when you're focused and present with your friends, right? Um, anything under the sun, lovely expression, meaning anything and everything, right? He liked anything under the sun as a child. A carefree childhood, another good collocation, meaning a childhood when he has no worries. And then he says, I deride a lot of pleasure from what I do means I get a lot of pleasure, but very, very nice vocabulary. I notice also generally he's using adverbs as connectors at the beginning of sentences, which helps his fluency. He says, literally anything under the sun. Thankfully, I had a good childhood. Hopefully, I can grow the business. And these adverbs really help you connect, start a sentence and guide the listener which is really, really good. Talking about um, sport, he said, I'm quite into fitness. So I like fitness uh, a, a little, quite, not a little, not a lot in the middle. <laughs> um, he says, I was a natural at football. I was a natural at something means you didn't have to work hard at it. It just came naturally. And then he shows off his vocabulary in football. I can dribble easily. That was unexpected, right? To dribble is when you're running with the ball at the same time. Um, and then he says a lovely idiom, not to toot my own horn, but I was very good at football. To toot my own horn is to brag or say, I am the best at something. So it's a good expression when you are saying you're good at something, but you don't want to brag, right? In Britain, we say to blow my own trumpet, but I recognize the American idiom, very, very similar, right? And a final note on his grammar, right? Look at this sentence. I should have started much earlier because my life has been transformed. Talking about going to the gym. I should have started is the present perfect with a modal. Talking about something in the past that didn't happen, but you wanted it to. Um, my life has been transformed present perfect describing the change from the past to the present since he's been going to the gym. This is a complex grammar sentence. And I think the important thing is not that Jorbeck is thinking how to create complex grammar and use difficult tenses. It just came naturally because he has practiced these structures so much that when he wants to express an idea, it just comes out naturally. That's the way to do it, right? You can't be overthinking in the test. It just has to come naturally from years of practice. Brilliant. Let's move on to the next part, part three. Moving on from the FA Cup, let's, um, let's talk about 
um, festivals, traditional festivals as well? Because I, I don't know much about Uzbekistan. I mean, I'm going to put my cards on the table. So when it comes to traditional festivals, um, I mean, in your country, what are the most important traditional festivals? Um, Navruz comes to my mind. Um, Navruz is the most important um, festival. It's It has Zoroastrian origins, but it's still uh, practiced in Uzbekistan. And it's like, it marks the beginning of summer. Uh, no, not, not summer, spring. It marks the beginning of spring. And it's the 21st of um, March. I, I believe that's the when day length and night length Maybe I'm 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 not too sure about it, but that's the most important uh, festival that's celebrated nationwide. And girls put on a uh, special Uzbek dress called Atras and Atlas, and and usually they cook um, something called sumalak. Um, it's an uh, it's a national meal and that's cooked in a big um, how do you say it in a big pot I believe, and it's cooked over over a day. Yeah, mm-hmm. it takes it for it to be ready. And I think that's the most important festival in Uzbekistan. Although it, nowadays, um, like well, what's happening in one part of Uzbekistan, a flower festival is taking place. Okay, right. Interesting. What about young people? I mean, uh, do, do young children like to learn about traditional festivals? Um, I'm not sure if young people are really, you know, willing to learn about um I think it has to do with how globalization has swept um, and has had a, had a sweeping effect on all countries. And then we don't necessarily really enjoy being part of these celebrations. I, I don't see my, for example, brothers, little brothers enjoying these festivals as much as they enjoy uh, celebrating, say, Halloween. And I think nowadays young people, I think, are more into what you would call um, shared international um, mm. culture as opposed to their own culture. They seem to be less in, um, what is the word, in tune with their own culture, I guess. Okay. So do, do you think that maybe governments should be promoting local festivals more? Yes, definitely. I think uh, governments should promote uh, so that they preserve their cultures and traditions. I think it, uh, festivals are a great way to improve unity um, and uh, solidarity within the nation. I think pe- when people um, participate in these kinds of communal activities, um, they feel a sense of like, you know, belonging to this nation. Mm-hmm. And then when they in- enjoy these festivals with other people from their own country, um, I think it gives them a, a lot of uh, pride in the fact that they are uh, unique in certain respect. And I do believe, yes, government should invest a good amount of money into promoting these kinds of festivals. And how can they do it? What's a good way um, to do it? I think now social media is the best way to to do that. I, I think so. You, they they could, you know, get contact, get in contact with uh, influencers, and the influencers can, you know, share how they are part of these um, events. You know, for example, these influencers have fan meetings in the same way. Maybe they are part of these festivals, and then young people join in. Um, these festivals, and I think it's a good way to um, to encourage the, the participation. Um, apart from influencers, I think uh, maybe promoting it on. I'm not sure if traditional media is still going to be helpful uh, in promoting these kinds of events. But generally, yeah, uh, probably influencers are most right. helpful. Okay. Agents. And um, would you agree that people spend too much money? on celebrations and festivals? Um, yes, I think um, on celebrations, sometimes they end up spending too much money, um, um, like especially weddings. I think obscene amount of money is spent, especially in my country, um, because I mean, for a day to me, um, you know, that seems a lot, that seems to be a lot of money. I mean, mm-hmm. for for a band, uh, for, a, um, for, for all the, you know, refreshments and drinks and for food, obviously, um, a lot of money is needed, and I, I believe um, sometimes some some a sit a, a sit down is necessary uh, between people so that they know uh, how much money is going into this event, so that mm-hmm. they don't find themselves as after the event in debt or like uh, financially struggling. Right. Okay, let's talk about Jurbeck's um, performance in these part three style questions, right? Overall, it's great because he develops his answers 
He's giving examples, quite specific examples, which helps show off his vocabulary. And he just gets into the flow. You can just feel this rhythm as he's speaking. Let's talk about a few different aspects. Um, he says he talks about one festival called, uh, I think it was Navrus or Navrus. And he said, it marks the beginning of spring. It marks, it indicates, right? Or shows the beginning of spring. Um, like Christmas marks the birth of Christ. Okay. He wasn't too sure about it being the longest day or the shortest day in the year. But remember, the facts don't matter in IELTS. It's your English that matters. A note about using words in your own language. It's fine. He does it a few times. He said on, on Navarus that they cook something called smalek. It's a national meal. I've never heard of smalek. I don't know what it is. But he says they cook something called. So it's clear what it is. And then he goes on to explain what it is. So don't worry about having to translate words all the time. You can use words like festivals and dishes, names of films and books in your own language. Just make it clear what it is. Um, also, I'd like to draw your attention to self-correction. He does make one or two mistakes, but he did correct himself. He said globalization swept instead of swept, but he stopped and went, globalization has had a sweeping effect, which is perfect. So he stopped, corrected himself and carried on. It's what a native speaker would do. It's absolutely fine, right? And it's great language, right? Globalization has had a sweeping effect. If you can imagine a broom moving everything underneath it or changing everything, globalization moves everything with it, right? It's lovely. There's another example of looking for the right word. And what I love about this is that he, he just stops and takes his time. So he said, talking about young people, right? He said, they seem to be, what is the word, in tune with their own culture? So he can't remember exactly the expression. So he stops and actually says, what is the word? And then he says it perfectly, in tune with their own culture, right? They're in tune with something means they're on the same wavelength, um, that they are connected very strongly with their culture. It's absolutely fine. Again, what a native speaker would do. So take the time to stop and pause if you feel something's not right and then carry on. He shows off great vocabulary, right? Talking about the government, how they can promote these festivals, improve unity and solidarity, feel a sense of belonging. It gives them a lot of pride. And these expressions just roll off his tongue without thinking. He's just, you can feel he's in the flow. That's what you get from lots and lots of practice, really. And I love this expression at the end. He says, it's an obscene amount of money is spent on weddings. An obscene amount is a lot, right? It means a disgusting amount, too much, a lot. And notice the use of the passive tense. It's nice, right? And I notice all the way through his pronunciation is just about flawless. I mean, his word stress, sentence stress, the rhythm and intonation is very natural. He has connected speech. It's really, really nice. But remember, right, over IELTS speaking over the whole test, you need the fluency to show your vocabulary, that range of grammar as well as pronunciation. And Jorbic, he, he has it all and he does really, really, really well. So great. Let's listen in now as we talk a bit about advice and tips for students. Great. Okay. Well, let, let me change the direction. That's our IELTS conversation. Um, let me switch a little bit because, I mean, you are a teacher as well as a student. I mean, you told me recently that you, you did the IELTS test. You, you got about nine in speaking, which was absolutely awesome. I mean, congratulations. That is so good. Um, but I think it's not come easily. And, you know, tell me a, a little bit how about, well, let, let's say, how you've how you've learned and prepared for IELTS and advice you'd give to other students. Um, 
Um, at this point, I don't really prepare for the test because I do teaching, and I when I am doing teaching, that's basically you know equates with preparation. I guess that's preparation for me. Um, but I, I believe what what I do with my students, we prepare for you know common IELTS topics, for example. I mean, you you tend to do that a lot in your channel. Like, let's assume in part one, you should definitely have answers for your hometown, home, and work or studies. And, and all the other, you know, your interest and how you spend your weekends and, and those kinds of questions you need to get ready. Um, and in the same way, in speaking of part three, a lot of the questions are related to trends. Um, mm. So social trends. So you need to keep your breast of what's happening in the world and, and what's your attitude towards that. And, and I believe the best thing you can do to get prepared for this exam is to look at common IELTS topics and there are so many websites uh, online and then you check what, what common IELTS topics um, they usually have in the exam and you prepare for those topics and it's very likely that you're going to have one of them in your exam. Right, nice, very, very good advice. I totally agree. Yeah, common topics is great. Now your, I mean, your spoken English is flawless and students oh. thinking about developing their speaking skills, what advice would you give them? How can they do that? Oh, thank you for compliment. But yeah, I think there's a lot of room for improvement. Um, I find myself like every now and then when I when I listen to myself, I find myself um, mispronouncing a word. Oh, like I've been because my muscle memory um, mm -hmm. has been like fossilized, I guess. And mm -hmm. there are certain fossilized errors. And I find myself like mispronouncing word. And then obviously it's difficult to learn a new one because you need to unlearn and relearn. Um, but I would encourage anyone who's um, trying to speak better is to expose themselves to English as much as possible. Um, so I think input is number one thing. So I think a lot of people rush to start making output and they want to speak immediately. Mm -hmm. I think they have to with some, some polyglots promoting speak from day one. I honestly don't buy, buy that. Um, I, I think you should, you know, try to, you know, take your time, just, Expose yourself again to use the the same word um, English as much as possible. You watch movies. Um, you know, I, I believe I personally like um, sitcoms a lot because they're short, they're funny, and I believe a lot of people enjoy comedy. Um, and and then you listen to whatever you are interested in. I I think nowadays there has been a. I mean nowadays everyone makes a podcast. So so I think you can listen to podcasts on on whatever you happen to enjoy. If there is a, um, um, if there is, if you're interested in fashion, I'm sure there is somebody making a podcast about it and you listen to that. And when you, in language learning, it's very important that you keep things fun. And and when do you keep things fun? When you are listening to or doing things or reading, watching things you're interested in. I, I'm, I'm, I think that's what's going to be helpful. That's brilliant. That's very, very good advice. I think focusing on things you enjoy doing is great. Um, and yeah, overall, I mean, there's so much material out there. I mean, you emphasize the exposure to the language and that input and listening, which I totally agree. Um, and I guess nowadays there's no excuse because there's so much on the internet. If you can navigate around it and find good yeah. stuff, there is plenty and plenty of stuff. I've seen your interview with Steve Kaufman, I guess. Right? Steve Kaufman, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, you guys also talked about uh, language learning and you know how it should I think happen. Um, yeah. I, while I think there is no one way to go about learning a language, um, I think what he has uh, as a method and like in, in in his own um website, it's called it's called Eight Lingo or something like that. Yeah. I think he's he's got a lot of good advice too, and you, they can check out your video with him too. Yeah, absolutely. He has a lovely seven point kind of system to 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 learn languages, and one of the points is do stuff you enjoy so you're motivated. Yeah which is really, really good. Excellent. Um, well, this has been really, really interesting. It's been fascinating. I I'm sure students would like to find out more about you. I mean, if pe people watching want to, where can they find you? Um, I'm mostly active on Telegram. So I've got a um, Telegram channel that's called Your Bex and IELTS. Um, so okay. I'll put that in the link below. Global search and put it, uh, they'll find my channel. And I also run a YouTube channel. Um, nice. It's called Exiles standardized tests, um, and I make videos mostly on reading um, at this time, um, mm. at this point. And but I'm 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 thinking of doing more, uh, you know, speaking and YouTube like writing videos too. 
Right. Fantastic. So you're offering the full, not just speaking, you're offering the full four skills yes. development. Yes. Right. Fantastic. That's great. Well, listen, uh, Diorbeck, thank you so much for joining me today. It's been really interesting. Um, yes. And um, I think some great advice yes. for the students. Okay. Fantastic. Take care. We'll speak again soon. Thank you. Bye. All the best. Bye-bye. Some very, very nice advice from Jorbic. So just to summarize, his key tips were, first, prepare common topics. Second, expose yourself um, to the language, right? Get lots of input. And also read, watch, and listen to things that you enjoy. Absolutely brilliant. Great. Um, listen, if you want to find out more about Jorbic, and his Telegram channel, YouTube channel, the links are all down in the description below. I'm sure he will be an inspiration, not only for the students of Uzbekistan, but students all around the world. Thank you so much, uh, Jorbik, and to all of you for watching. If you've liked it, please do subscribe to my channel, English Speaking Success, turn on the notifications. And if you want the key points from today's interview, there is a PDF in the description below. You can download that for free. Great. Thank you so much for joining me. Have a great week and uh, I'll see you in the next video. Take care. Bye-bye.